history of America since Sumter County reflects the history of the state and the nation. It is a history of pioneers who carved a civilization out of the wilderness. A history of the perseverance of those who overcame the devastation of slavery and civil war. A history of the entrepreneurial spirit that built the eighth largest city in Georgia. A history of capable 20th century leaders who restored the fortunes lost by the previous generation. America in Sumter County, home of a Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, a U.S. Attorney General, and a President. The birthplace and headquarters of Habitat for Humanity, and today the steward of one of Georgia's best preserved historic districts. The history of America and Sumter County is the story of a proud, enduring people who with each new generation have faced great challenges with courage and hope. Thousands of years before white settlement, Native Americans called the land along the Thronatiska or Flint River their home. Before cotton fields dotted the landscape of what would become Sumter County, Members of the Creek Confederation relied upon the rich lands of the region for corn. They hunted the forest and fished the streams of southwest Georgia. But as white Georgians continued their search for virgin soil, the Creeks would find themselves removed from their ancestral home by land-hungry pioneers. For at least 10,000 years before European settlers came into what's now uh, Sumter County, this area was occupied by the ancestors of and later by the Creek Confederation of Indians. The Creeks were unique in that they were not one tribe but a group of 14 tribes who had entered into a confederation. In what's now Sumter County, the tribes or the members of the, of the confederation who were here would have been the Hittichi who were in southwest part of the county, the Yuchi who would have been in the northern part of the county, the Kashida who would have also been in the northern part of the county, and maybe even the Sheha who were in the southern part of the county. N among the Indians who were here throughout the county were, there are now areas that were settlements. Uh, the airport site when it was excavated proves that at least as far back as 20,000 years ago, there were people in this county. Uh, notable personalities who relate to the history of Sumter County are uh, Chief Falemi, whose village stood on the lower side, on the Sumter County side of the Flint River, uh, below where Cobb is now, was a man who had once been friends of the United States but on the 21st of April, 1818, between the hours of 11 and 12 o'clock, the Chatham County Militia under Captain Obed Wright uh, uh, attacked and massacred the inhabitants of the village at Sheehaw, which was located in Lee County on the Kitchifuni Creek. This so incensed Falemi that he who had once been friends with the, with the white people and the U.S. government decided that that was not going to be the case anymore and he became a notorious cattle thief and troublemaker among the lower creeks much to the consternation of Benjamin Hawkins and uh, Timothy and Tim Pucci Barnard. Barnard was the first white man to settle in this part of Georgia having come to the area in what is now Macon County in the 1780s or perhaps even as early as the 1760s, depending upon which source one chooses to believe. This section of Georgia was opened up to white settlement with the land lottery of 1827, a direct result of the um, Treaty of Indian Springs in 1825 when the creek ceded this section of Georgia between the Flint River and the Chattahoochee River uh, to the state. The first settlers that arrived here were of, um, shall we say, a boisterous nature. They were uh, hard working, hard playing, hard drinking in many cases, uh, people. It was uh, the frontier. This was uh, at a time when Hawkinsville and Pulaski County was the jumping off point for the end of civilization. 
and those first settlers came to uh, what is now Sumter County, originally Lee County, in, uh, in uh, January of 1828. They moved in here and began cutting away the virgin forest and uh, found themselves in a portion of Lee County, which at that time had its capital in a place called Starkville. So they uh, decided that the trip down to Starkville was really too far and preferred to have their own county. So uh, they applied for uh, the creation of Sumter County, named at that time for the only surviving Revolutionary War general, General Thomas Sumter, the fighting Gamecock of South Carolina. And uh, on May the, uh, excuse me, on December the 26th, 1831, Sumter County was born, created by an act of the legislature. Shortly thereafter, in the uh, summer of 1832, about the middle of July, the uh, surveying crew had had uh, picked Landlot 156 in the 27th district of originally Lee County, the top of a hill, for partly for defensive purposes because of the Indians who were still around. Anyway, the town square was laid off. They did some gambling. They did some horse races and then decided to have a ceremony to name the town, this new capital of this new county. And so they decided to, all the commissioners decided to get together and put names in a hat. And the uh, three-year-old son of the Superior Court clerk, a young man named Joseph Absalom Cobb, they, named, they called him Knapp. Little Knapp was blindfolded, and he was supposed to reach in the hat and pull out a name. Well, just before he reached up to the hat, the uh, county treasurer and also our state senator, uh, Lovett B. Smith, stood up and said, I've got a name. And everybody said, well, what's that? And he said, Americus. Where did Lovett Smith get a name like Americus? Well, he was one of the few educated people in the area at the time. Most people were illiterate and didn't read or write at all. But uh, Mr. Smith picked the, Itali the Latin version of the Italian navigator of the New World, who not coincidentally has continents named after him, Amerigo Vespucci. The earliest period of settlement in southwest Georgia in Sumter County in the 1820s and 30s, after the Indian session of 1825, would have been characterized by very simple uh, original built, well, originally tents and brush shelters, um, soon replaced by more permanent log buildings. Very little of this has survived to the present day. Uh, the first frame buildings would have been erected from the early 1830s after the establishment of sawmills. Uh, there was a sawmill built at Americus within the first year of settlement um, and the first frame building was built on the square within a year or two after that. The first courthouse was built a frame in I believe in 1834. When people think of the history of the antebellum south and antebellum Georgia, they generally think that the population were, were the descendants of earlier settlers from Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, or North Carolina who had come down, oh, maybe in the 1780s. This is not the case, in fact, and in reality. Uh, in Sumter County, in the 1840s and 1850s, and into the 1860s, you had a number of families who were from divergent and diverse backgrounds. You had a number of Irish families who came here after the famine in the 1840s. You had Scotsmen like William Hagerson, who was here at least by 1840. You had the Renew family who were here even though they were from England. They were escapees from the French Revolution, the grandfather having escaped in 1797. They were here by 1832. You had a number of Germans, and in fact, Americans in the 1860s and 1870s had a sizable Jewish population. The Cohen family, the Seisel family, the uh, Westheimer family, to mention only a few. In the 1870 census, I've counted no fewer than 21 Jewish families in Sumter County. Uh, so the myth of a Protestant evangelical being all in all in the Old South is simply not true. You had Catholic Irish, you had German Jews, you had Russian Jews, Polish Jews, you had Scots Presbyterians, you had people of many different backgrounds in this county at that time. 
Based upon an unofficial census of the white population taken by W.B. Gary in Americas in June of 1846, the young county seat numbered only 177 persons, some 37 families. And by 1850, the population had risen to only 300. Although slow growth marked the first decades of the community's history, Americas and Sumter County would experience a boom in the 1850s with the arrival of the Southwestern Railroad, a main line projected from Macon into the rich farmlands of Southwest Georgia. The uh, railroad in 1850 ended in Oglethorpe, about 15 or 20 miles north of here, and the railroad intended to extend it straight west to the Chattahoochee River and would have passed through a small place called Pond Town, which is now the, the small town of Ellaville in the adjoining county to the north, Shalai County, which at that time was still part of Sumter. Um, one of the local people who showed up here in uh, 1849, Timothy Matthews Furlow, uh, who had already established a reputation back in uh, Bibb County for uh, uh, political acumen. He, was a, a, he had served in the legislature up there. He came to America, uh, established a large plantation, uh, built a huge mansion uh, on a 40-acre lot uh, on South Le where South Lee Street and College Street are now. And uh, he went to the railroad directors and asked what could they possibly, what could America's possibly do to divert the railroad to us instead of southwest from Oglethorpe to us instead of going straight west to Pond Town. Well, they basically said come up with seventy-five thousand dollars. Three weeks later, after canvassing the local community and, and dealing with some of the other uh, very influential people, um, not the least among whom would be uh, uh, Alan Cutts and uh, Willis A. Hawkins, uh, these men, prominent in their individual fields uh, and well-to-do, raised that $75,000 in only three weeks, and Furlow went back to the directors of the railroad, presented them with the uh, money, and the railroad was promptly rerouted to Americas. It arrived here on October the 1st, 1854. Uh, of course, it was a huge uh, event. Uh, people were, some people were frightened at the sound of the giant iron horse. Uh, different people had different reactions to it, but everybody was glad to see it arrive because that meant commerce uh, connecting us to the rest of the world and uh, economic development on a massive scale. June of 1859, the Furlough Masonic Female College was established here in Americas, again through the good efforts of not only the Masons, but Timothy M. Furlough, and also, uh, as original incorporators, the uh, aforementioned Willis A. Hawkins and Alan Cutts. Uh, the school served the community for 20 years, from 1859 to 1879. The coming of the railroad to Americas in 1854 sparked a boom in population growth and construction. Uh, actu actually, this boom started a bit before, the, before 1854 in anticipation of the railroads coming. A, a great number of new houses were built as well as uh, commercial buildings and public buildings, uh, the, including the uh, first brick courthouse built in the early 1850s. The first brick commercial buildings were built uh, on downtown streets in the 1850s. Uh, substantial buildings with party walls uh, in, to replace the simple wooden buildings of a j decade or two earlier, um, as well as uh, new churches and uh, a large brick college on what is now called College Street. Um, houses of the period were primarily in the Greek Revival style with uh, classical columns, usually dark, usually in fact square, um, wide corner boards, um, symmetrical facades. Uh, this was especially true of the uh, single story houses, uh, cottages. Several larger houses were built in, in the 1850s, however, two-story versions of, of the center hall house. These were in a variety of styles. Uh, several of them were Greek Revival, but of the larger houses, more of them were built in the Italianate style, 
um, in the decade before, prior to the war between the states. Um, nearly all large houses built in Sumter County during this period were built in the city of Americus. Uh, very few were built out on the farms and plantations. It was more a matter of planters' houses in town as well as merchants and professional men. When we speak of slavery in Sumter County, we're speaking of a period of about 30 to 35 years. This is slightly more than one generation. We were a new county, we were the frontier, heavily wooded, a few people came in, they brought slaves with them. We didn't have many to start with here in the early 1830s. The big plantation areas, the large concentrations of slaves, were in the rice counties along the coast, where it wasn't uncommon to have two, three, four hundred slaves in a slave-owning family. Here in Sumter County, with few exceptions, if you had 20, 25, or 30 slaves, you were considered a big plantation owner. You will not find the big homes. You will find good working farms, 500, 600, 1,000 acres. As the years passed from the formation of the county in 1831, we saw that you had absentee landowners come in. Uh, General Howell Cobb's family came in, had almost 100 slaves. This was just one of their plantations. A gentleman from Bibb County, Huguenin, he had over 200 slaves here in Sumter County. This was just one of his plantations. You had fewer people own slaves, but the people who owned them owned larger amounts of slaves. But when you look at slavery in the overall context, the vast majority of the people, over 51% in Sumter County, owned between one and five slaves. Had the war between the states not come about, Sumter County would have probably been much more slave-oriented than it was at the start because from the 1840s through the 1860s you, you saw a continuing increase of slaves, the actual number, while you had the decrease in the owners, you had more and more slaves being brought into the county by these absentee landlords, you had plantations that were growing larger and larger in acreage. You had, again, a very large investment here. Although Americus and Sumter County were, for most of the Civil War, too far from the lines of battle to be directly involved in action, the region did supply both men and materiel to the Confederate cause. Toward the war's end, the little settlement of Anderson Station, a town situated along the main line of the Southwestern Railroad, would find itself chosen to be the site of a prison camp for Union soldiers. The same railroad would bring hundreds of Confederate wounded to makeshift hospitals established in Americus to treat the casualties of General Sherman's advance through Georgia. The war would bring devastating change to Americus and Sumter County. The decade of the 1860s stands in stark contrast to the previous decade. The impact of the war on Americus and Sumter County was enormous, to put it, to put it mildly. Uh, there were a number of Confederate units that were organized here. The, uh, the patriotic fervor of the young men of the town and the county w was uh, a wonder to behold. In uh, April of 1861, the first unit, the Sumter Light Guards, was organized with Captain William L. Johnson. The Sumter Light Guards, though, enjoyed the distinction of, with only one other unit in the entire war, of having a band that served with them throughout the entire four years. They are memorialized, uh, the America's Brass Band, is uh, memorialized by a group of California reenactors who uh, use antique instruments from the time period, perform concerts around the country, even contributed to the uh, uh, music in the movie Glory. People should be aware that Sumter County was known as the Egypt of the Confederacy because of the tremendous uh, agricultural output that came from here. One of the local businessmen, Uriah Bullock Harold, uh, 
was the uh, commissary agent for the Confederacy. He was uh, instrumental in supplying not only the uh, uh, Confederate Army with uh, food and provisions, but also uh, in 1864 when uh, the uh, Confederacy established what was then called Camp Sumter, uh, but is better known in American history and Georgia history as uh, Andersonville Prison. Uh, when those first prisoners arrived in February of 1864, they were also supplied by uh, Uriah Harold as the commissary agent. Um, then, uh, toward the end of that year, uh, at the end of August in 1864, uh, by which time Americus had basically been converted into a hospital, since no hostilities ever actually took place in this part of Georgia. We never had any actual fighting around here. but. Um, Wounded Confederate soldiers were being brought back from the battlefield and, and hospitals were established here in America. So there were two formal hospitals, the Bragg Hospital located at the old uh, Furlough Masonic Female College on South Jackson Street, about two blocks south of the Central Business District, but the, and the Ford Hospital in the downtown area named after one of the local doctors. Uh, finally, in the last months of the war, during uh, Sherman's March to the Sea in the fall of 1864, uh, General Howell Cobb, who was one of the leading lights of the Confederacy and one of the most prominent individuals uh, in Georgia history in the uh, 19th century, uh, although his family was living in Athens, and, and his family goes back there a tremendous amount of time, uh, he had extensive land holdings here in Sumter County with his in-laws, the Lamars. And uh, to get out of Sherman's way in the fall, uh, General Cobb bought the old Willis Hawkins house here in Americus on South Lee Street and refugeed the family here during the last months of the war and then when the uh, when Appomattox and the and the surrender ended uh, came about in the following spring uh, they returned to their home in Athens. The first federal troops to occupy Americus arrived in May of 1865. As weary Confederate veterans who survived the war, many of whom severely maimed during the brutal conflict, returned to their homes in Sumter County. The black population of the county would, for the first time in its history, participate in the political process, while the whites struggled with the new political and economic status of freed slaves. Both whites and former slaves would now face the challenge of rebuilding their lives in a world changed forever by war. With the arrival of emancipation in June of 1865 uh, and the registration of, of uh, black men as voters in, uh, in 1867 in preparation for the uh, election of 1868, um, uh, this was a whole new ball game for the black community basically and uh, the status change from servitude to uh, citizenship was, was striking to say the least. Uh, included among that number was one of the most important individuals in local black history, a gentleman named Elbert Head, who was, uh, uh, spent most of his life in slavery. He was born in 1817. Uh, but when he and his owner came to America in 1854, he was allowed to hire out, he and his wife were allowed to hire out their time, and they ran a, a washing business up on North Lee Street, which was still called Troop Street in those days. And uh, through careful industry and frugality, he and his wife saved all of their money, and when emancipation came, they put down their white aprons in the washing business, and uh, Albert had proceeded to invest in real estate buying up large chunks of land on the north side of town so that uh, he became, in fact in the 1870 census is listed as a broker by occupation. Ten years later in the 1880 census of America, his occupation is capitalist. In the late 1860s, after, after the end of the war, uh, a surprising amount of construction went on in, in town, more than more than is commonly thought. Um, people were moving into town from the country to start their lives over, um, and a fair number of houses were built in the first 10 years after, or so after the war between the states. Uh, a couple of more substantial houses were built, however, one being the first brick house built in Americas by Major Moses Spear in the late 1860s.
on Church Street. This house no longer survives. Um, and a very large and impressive house built by Dr. E.J. Eldridge on Lee Street at the foot of Taylor Hill. As Reconstruction ended and Sumter County moved into the 1880s, the building of a new railroad would cause a second boom in the community's development. By 1890, the once small town of Americus became a prosperous city with a 75% increase in its population over the previous decade. Americus became the eighth largest town in Georgia. A booming population and economy led to political power on both the state and national levels. Educational, civic, and social organizations flourished, and the community underwent a building boom that gave Americus much of its architectural character. From the post-Reconstruction era till the end of the century, Americus bought into, in a big way, to the New South concept which was brought here in 1889 by the voice of the New South, Henry W. Grady, when he spoke at a uh, Confederate Veterans Reunion at the old Courthouse Square. Uh, it was necessary to shift from a one-crop agriculture based on cotton to diversify, although cotton remains a very powerful influence here until the 1920s, but to diversify into an industrial uh, leg of the economy that would be accompanied by a growth in urban development here in the city of Americas especially. Uh, in fact, we end up in the 1880s and 1890s being the eighth largest city in the state of Georgia based on our population. The biggest single factor contributing to that, of course, would be the arrival of the railroads. Not just the one that came here in 1854, but the expansion of railroad transportation here connecting us to uh, Alabama, South Carolina, Tennessee, uh, through especially the, the development of uh, Samuel Hawkins' railroad empire. Uh, Americus is proud to be the home of the man who uh, had the only privately capitalized railroad in the history of the state of Georgia. But at the same time that Sam Hawkins was doing this in the 1880s, and with it the, uh, uh, the growth of additional towns, uh, the plains of Dura moved to its present location, dropped the of Dura and became simply plains. Uh, Leslie and DeSoto were born about this time. Uh, John Edgar Dawson Ship of Americus went to uh, what was then Dooley but now Crisp County in 1888 and founded the town of Cordell, named for Sam Hawkins' wife and daughter. Uh, the, growth, the growth because of the railroad is just absolutely astonishing. Uh, UB Harold uh, was involved in developing the Buena Vista and Ellaville Railroad at about the same time. So Americus was able to boast in the late 1880s and early 90s of having two railroad barons, not only in the same city, but literally living right across the street from each other. UB Harold's house was facing Sam Hawkins' house. A number of prominent individuals who uh, contributed to this great growth, the, uh, the arrival of the Sheffield family in the uh, 1870s and 1872 to be specific, J.W. Sheffield in the hardware business, uh, Frank Sheffield, uh, founder of the Bank of Commerce in 1891, which evolved over the years into what is now Wachovia Bank. It's the oldest continuing uh, bank business in our, in our community. Uh, Major Moses Spear, who was a uh, uh, a man who started out uh, with uh, after the Civil War with a bale of cotton and parlayed that into a banking empire. Uh, he was a founder of the Americus Manufacturing and Improvement Corporation. He was responsible almost single-handedly for the construction of the Windsor Hotel, which was his which was his big project. Um, we had uh, the Wheatley brothers, John W. Wheatley, Charles M. Wheatley, and and Thornton Wheatley, who uh, contributed enormously to our community and, and succeeding generations of their family as well. Uh, the uh, growth of the city from a, from a population of under 5,000 to a population almost double that as we entered into the next century. Tremendous growth in the residential areas. Literally hundreds of houses were built. Areas that, uh, in, we have a wonderful 1885 aerial view of the city with large open areas and 23 years later when they did another aerial view 
all those had filled up with houses. So there's a tremendous growth, not only in uh, residential structures, but in the downtown area. We had a, uh, the new courthouse in 1888, uh, the city hall in 1890, the Windsor Hotel in 1892. It was just an incredible boom period for economic development in, in Americas and in, in, uh, Sumter County. A number of, of course, of large, substantial, elaborate houses were built in this period, more than any period before or probably since, um, mostly in the Queen Anne style from the late 1880s through the 90s to the turn of the century. Um, a good example of, of a very large house of the period is the uh, Malcolm Council House on Reese Park. Another, the Uriah Harold House at the, on Lee Street at the corner of College. Uh, both of these are very large buildings, uh, very elaborate. Um, a little more ordinary in size, the Speaker Crisp House on Taylor Street um, has all the hallmarks of the style. Um, the Ed Ansley House on College Street uh, a very attractive house from sort of the early part of this period, the late 1880s, is the house at the corner of Church Street and Brown Street. I believe it was built by a Stewart family. Americas has dozens of houses from this period, so uh, I can only mention a few, but it, it, it is, was our period of our greatest growth and uh, still really what Americas is known for today is the uh, late Victorian architecture. By the end of the century, although Americas was still the eighth largest city in the state and it was still a growing place and, and there were still businesses going gangbusters here, uh, the Windsor Hotel had gone into uh, receivership and, and uh, it generally was a case of the bubble bursting. With the dawn of a new century, Americas and Sumter County witnessed the rise of a new generation of leaders who would rebuild the community's fortunes following the financial downturn of the previous decade. Both black and white communities would see the improvement of educational opportunities, and both would endure the effects of a world war. Sadly, the dream of continuing prosperity would be cut short by the agricultural and banking failures of the mid-1920s. After the bubble burst at the end of the New South era, the new century was greeted by uh, a second generation. As C. Wright Mills, the American sociologist, in his book The uh, Sociological Imagination, referred to power elites. Americas is a classic example of power elites. The generation that produced the boom of the second half of the 19th century was succeeded literally by their offspring. Uh, and probably the most prominent example of this would be William Harris Crawford Wheatley, the son of John W. Wheatley. Crawford Wheatley was uh, a prominent businessman, highly educated, an architect. He uh, had a, the America's Construction Company and the America's Refrigerating Company. He uh, was also very active in politics. He was our state senator and our state representative at two different times early in the uh, 20th century. His single biggest contribution to Americas was the uh, establishment in 1908 of what was then called the Third Congressional District Agricultural and Mechanical School. It has now become Georgia Southwestern State University and still serves our community. This would be Crawford Wheatley's lasting, most lasting contribution. Then we have the uh, development of, uh, in the, at, toward the end of the second decade of, of World War I, so uh, we gain here in Sumter County, Souther Field, which was built in uh, 1918, 1917, 1918, as a training school for pilots who were going off to uh, fight the Kaiser. In 1923, uh, a young wing walker, uh, Daredevil, showed up in our community in May of that year, and uh, stayed here about two weeks. And from uh, from uh, Mr. Weish out at the out at Southern Field, for five hundred dollars, he bought a Jenny and made his first solo flight. That young man, four years later, would would go on to be the first uh, American to fly solo across the Atlantic uh, 
uh, from the United States to uh, France, and that was, of course, Charles Augustus Lindbergh. And then the decade of the teens closes out with uh, more development, another case of a second generation power elite coming in. Walter Rylander uh, was responsible for, uh, in 1920, the Rylander Building, uh, which is now the Habitat for Humanity headquarters. Uh, in 1916, another major building in that complex. And uh, his crowning jewel was 1921, which was the Rylander Theater. America's recovery from the after effects of the panic of financial panic of 1893 coincided with a national shift in taste uh, away from the uh, freewheeling late Victorian period to uh, uh, renewed interest in, in classicism um, and symmetry, balance, etc. And in historical styles, um, in America, uh, several public buildings and commercial buildings uh, built or from the turn of the century reflect this. Uh, the Planners Bank Building, um, what was later called the Citizens Bank Building, at the corner of Lee Street and Forsyth Street. Uh, our second tallest building in America, after the Windsor Hotel, was built in 1900. The first residents in town to uh, return to uh, symmetrical uh, classical detailing was built by Lee Council, who was associated with the Planners Bank. This house is now the headquarters of the Sumter Historic Trust, uh, built in local red brick uh, with elaborate terracotta ornaments. Public buildings in the first couple of decades of the 20th century re reflect the uh, renewed interest in historicism of the period, um, from the uh, neoclassical or classical revival Carnegie Library built in 1908 on Jackson Street, and the old post office, now municipal building, built about 1910 on Lamar Street. A couple of prominent churches were also built in this period. Um, one is the uh, neoclassical First Methodist Church in a very different style, uh, built just a couple of years earlier, Calvary Episcopal Church on South Lee Street is uh, designed in English Gothic style. Uh, this has the distinction of being America's only building and if I'm not greatly mistaken, Georgia's only building designed by the uh, prominent church architect of the period, Ralph Adams Cram of Boston. After the early 1920s and the failure of most of the local banks, uh, America's entered into a period of decline. Of course, the nation entered into a period of decline, and we, with the exception of the Tudor Revival House built by the Marshall family outside Americas, we pretty much see no significant building after about 1930. Although Americas and Sumter County never saw again the enormous population growth and economic expansion of the boom years, the community survived the Depression era and continued to play a significant role in the politics and economy of Georgia. Today, citizens of Americas and Sumter County mark with pride the accomplishments of their ancestors by preserving the rich legacy of the past while promoting growth for the future. This is the story of Americas and Sumter County, the story of a proud, endearing people who continue to face great challenges with courage and hope.